Hello, today we are going to look at rotation. So let's go ahead and dive right in uh, to the review for the AP exam. Now, uh, let's first of all talk about I. So I is really important in um, rotation, and I is sort of the angular equivalent of M. And so I is your moment of inertia. And M is just your mass. So mass really is just how hard is it to push something, right? If I have more mass, it's harder to push it, right? So the angular version of that or the rotational version of that is how hard are you to rotate, right? How hard is something to rotate? If it's harder to rotate, then it has a higher I. Now, uh, what we'll do here is we want to think about I is very similar to mass. So for example, I have some weird shape. Um, maybe have like a, a disc and then I have this long beam and then I have another disc and I want to find the total I of this and it's rotating about this point kind of around like this rotating like that um, and so all I really have to do is actually just add these three shapes so just like if you have M and M total would just equal M1 plus M2 plus M3 I total is just equal to I1 plus I2 plus I3 or whatever different I's you have. So you can just add those up. Remember the general formula for I is this would be for um, just adding up different point masses would be the sum of MR squared. And then so that would be just a point mass. So I have something here, it's rotating about some point here and I kind of just go like that. Um, rotating about this uh, axis here and then this is my object here just some small point um, but then if we have a shape let's say a, uh, a cylinder which is also a disc this has an I of one half m r squared and then we have different I values for different shapes so like a sphere um, a hollow sphere um, a hoop where all my mass is distributed around that one is just I equals M R squared because all the mass is at this outer ring so it's just M R squared um, and they each have a different I. Now if I want to find a total I of a, a shape that has sort of a composite of different things and I just add up each individual I. Okay um, and so that's kind of the basics with what I is. Let's go ahead and jump right into kinematics. Now this is probably by far the easiest part of rotation and so this, we just have, instead of x, we have theta. Instead of v, we have omega. Instead of a, we have alpha. And so this is just like a normal kinematics question, but we're just using uh, different variables. So instead of going you know, side to side, we're going in some sort of circle. Okay. Um, this these types of questions would be you know it, it looks very similar to a kinematics question uh, where there is time involved that's usually a great hint that you need to use kinematics that time is involved in some way either they're giving you time or they're asking about time um, but for this instead of having distances we're going to have um, you know radians okay so instead of meters we have radians so theta is in radians uh, omega is in radians per second and then alpha angular acceleration is in radians per second squared okay um, so these questions aren't too much of a hassle um, you're just solving like a normal kinematics equation so for example if we have something like delta x equals v naught t plus one half a t squared this would just transform into delta theta equals omega naught t plus one half alpha t squared so everything stays exactly the same um, and this is true for kinematics and or rotation in general. Any equation you have that works in linear land, so just regular things, um, also works in angular land. You just have to transition to a different variable, right? So force becomes torque, um, distance becomes theta, uh, or x becomes theta. And so you just kind of transition into that and you can still use those things. Uh, one thing to remember, this uh, comes up very frequently is that theta times r equals x okay so the radians times the radius of the circle you're traveling in is equal to the distance um, this is somewhat intuitive if you go in one circle the radians would be 2 pi 
So 2 pi times r equals the distance, which would be the circumference. Um, so that's something uh, that is on the formula sheet, um, but that's a good thing to remember. That is something that you will need to use, especially in some of the more difficult torque style questions. Okay. Let's go ahead and look at torque now, as we kind of brought it up. So for this, uh, we're kind of working from a very similar thing as uh, forces. And so torque net equals I alpha. Instead of having F net equals MA, we have torque net equals I alpha. Remember, each individual torque is equal to RF sine theta. And so that's our radius times the force times sine theta. So that's an individual torque. Um, to use this equation, we use it just like we would use an F net. So I would add up my individual torques, torque one, maybe minus torque two equals I alpha, and then you could solve for something uh, using this. Um, one thing to remember is if you are rolling down an inclined plane, I can draw a free body diagram right quick here. So I have a, some sort of ball rolling down an inclined plane. I have my Fn, I have Mg straight down, and then I have FF up the inclined plane. The only one out of these three forces that's going to cause a torque is this FF. Your Fn will not cause a torque and your Mg will not cause a torque. Your Mg does not cause a torque because the radius for Mg is zero because it's coming from the center of mass. And then for your Fn, that also is not causing a torque because it's passing through the middle point. Because it's passing through the middle point, its radius is also zero, right? The other way you can think of it is my radius is from here to here and then my force is from here to here and you'll notice that the angle between those two things is zero so the sine of zero is just zero so that's another way of thinking of it um, showing that that torque of Fn is zero if I'm rolling down an inclined plane okay um, so your torque is just coming from this FF so if I was to set this up using torque I would do something like torque net equals uh, torque from friction. So I go ahead and plug in for the torque of friction. So I have R, F, F. Sine theta I don't need because the angle here is going to be 90 degrees. Okay, that angle there, that's 90 degrees. So I will just drop that sine theta because sine theta of, or sine of 90 is just one. And then I can plug in I alpha here. Um, and then you would just go ahead and continue to plug in. So R equals mu fn and then this would be i alpha you could plug in depending on the shape you'd plug in your eye uh, and you could use that maybe to solve for um, alpha or whatever the problem asks you for one of the thing that's one thing that's important to note is that oftentimes with torque questions not only do you need to set up a torque net but you also need to set up an f net so if this was the case where I had some ball rolling down hill and asked find acceleration I could set up this torque net here um, and then I would also want to actually set up an F net as well. So I'm actually going to go back and leave this as FF, um, and you'll see why in a second. So my F net is equal to MA. My F net is going to be MG minus FF. Now it's not all of MG. We're going to have to break that into components. Uh, if you're unsure of how to do that, um, make sure you go back and watch the forces video that I have. Um, so it be MG minus FF equals MA. And then what I could do is actually just plug in right here, FF equals I alpha over R. I can just go ahead and take that and plug that in for FF. And that gets rid of my friction force, that gets rid of mu, um, and I don't need to worry about friction at all. Uh, that friction part is kind of taken into account by the rotation of the disc or ball or whatever we have rolling down the inclined plane. Um, so that's one thing to remember. Um, it's usually as you're setting up torques, you need to set up both torque and force. Um, sometimes we also have a static type question. So this is usually maybe we have a beam here, um, and then maybe there's a mass here, and then we have some sort of tension here. And so for these, once again, we can set up this up with force, uh, and then maybe this is attached to the wall here. Okay. Um, so we can set this up with force. We have F net. Um, we'd want to set up like an Fx and an Fy because we have no net force. So I would set up all the forces in the x direction, set up all the forces in the y direction. Um, and then I can also set this up using a torque. The nice thing about setting up with torque is that because nothing is moving, it is not rotating at about any point. 
that means that I get to pick my pivot point. So you want to pick your pivot point based on what you don't know. Um, in this scenario, the force of the wall is going to be a bit of a weird force. It's going to have some sort of upward component, sort of maybe like a friction type component, um, or maybe it's just attached, bolted to the wall. And then it's also going to have a force that is out, uh, sort of a normal force that's pushing up. So you have this sum. Um, and that's usually where we put our pivot point because we don't know anything about that force. The reason I pick my pivot point there is because if I don't know the force, RF sine theta, if R is zero, then the torque of this force that I don't know anything about my force from the wall is going to be equal to zero. So I don't need to worry about it. I can just use the tension I have at, at some distance here and then my other mg from over here. So it has something like torque net equals zero. And then this tension is up, so I have torque from the tension, maybe minus torque from the mg equals zero. Okay, um, and then I would also make sure that I need to include also minus tension from the mass of the beam equals zero, uh, because this center of mass would also have an mg as well. Okay, um, so remember we would pick that pivot point based on the force that we don't know. If for some reason you needed to maybe solve for that force, uh, then you wouldn't want to put the pivot point there, right? Because I kind of cancel it out. But that would mean that I could pick a different pivot point and maybe pick this as my pivot point or this as my pivot point. Because it's not moving, I'm allowed to pick any pivot point that I want. But generally we pick the unknown force, the force I don't, I don't need to worry about and it would be difficult to solve for. Okay. Um, you also do need to set up your F net as well. Um, just like we had to set up an F net for these type and a torque net, you will also need to set up an F net for these type of forces as well. So you end up with two equations, two unknowns, and then you go ahead and solve that. Okay, so that was torque really quickly. Um, then let's look at energy. So energy, we're really just adding one extra equation to everything we already know about energy. So everything stays the same, but now we have Ke root. And instead of Ke equals 1 half mv squared, I'm going to have Ke root equals 1 half. And then instead of m, I will have, that's right, i. And then instead of v, I will have, that's right, omega or angular velocity. So just 1 half i omega squared. Um, so for this... It's not really doing anything extra. It's just saying you need to ask yourself an extra question. Is an object moving and is it rotating? Okay. Now, one thing to make sure is that some scenarios you can either use Ke or Ke rote, but you can't use both. Okay. An example of that would be something like um, I have a string attached to a ball here and then this ball is going around in a circle. Okay. I can either say it has Ke rote, where it's rotating about this circle here, or I can say it just has Ke because it's moving at this point. Okay, This one you cannot do both. Now if you think about the earth rotating about the sun, so I got the sun in the middle, right? I have the earth here, add a little bit of green, right? So that's my earth. Um, since the earth is both rotating like this, right, it's revolving around but then it's also going around the sun, then it has both, right? Because it's both rotating and moving side to side. So it's moving this side to side, and then it's also rotating, right? So another example would just be a ball rolling down an inclined plane. It's moving side to side, but then it's also rotating, okay? And so that would have both. Uh, you just need to make sure that uh, you think, is it rotating and is it moving side to side? Right? That means it has both. If it's just rotating, then it's just rotating, maybe just rotating in place. Or is it moving just side to side? Okay. So that really doesn't add anything else. You're still just using your EI equals EF. That's not really changing anything extra there. Last thing to talk about is angular momentum. So this one introduces a new formula. So just like P equals MV, here we have L equals I omega. Okay, um, And it's very similar where we can set up something like LI equals LF. Our initial angular momentum is equal to our final angular momentum. 
oftentimes with regular momentum, linear momentum, we don't see a change in mass. Usually it's sort of a constant mass. But for this type of question, we will often see I changing. So for example, this would be sort of an ice skater is skating, maybe they're holding heavy weights out, and then they bring these arms in, that's reducing our R, like if we go all the way back up to our I. If our, we have I equals this, if R goes down, if R is going down, that means I is also going down, okay? So if we have something like I omega equals I omega, if I goes down, then omega goes up. Okay? That means if you're bringing your arms in, you start to spin faster as this maybe ice skater, they're spinning, um, they want to spin faster, they just take their arms and move them in. I goes down, which means omega goes up. Remember, just like momentum cannot change unless there is a net external force, angular momentum cannot change unless there is a net external torque. Okay? Remember, not all forces cause a torque, and not all torques, well, all torques have a force. Um, but sometimes that force can cancel out from something else, okay? So this one's not too complicated. One thing to remember is that the angular momentum of like a point mass moving is just RMV. So I just need to multiply the radius that I have by the mass times velocity. Uh, if this was something that looked like maybe um, I'll have a bar here and I have a ball coming here. Um, heading this direction that's going to sort of hit this bar and then maybe cause this bar to rotate. This is my pivot point. So normally you would think, okay, this would be my radius. And then as it steps in, this is now my radius, right? Um, the easier way to think about this is I'm just going to use this length here. So wherever this ball ends up, it has to have the same angular momentum in both of these places because there's no net external force. This ball is just moving at a constant velocity. And so that radius you want to use is this radius here, okay? Um, and so that would be the radius you want to use, not the radius that's really true from this to here. It's sort of the projected radius. Where is that ball going to collide and what would the radius be at the collision point? Um, we know that we can use it because the net external, there's no force, right? Uh, so there can't be a torque. And because there's no torque, we know that there cannot be a change in angular momentum. Okay, um, and then this would bump into this and cause it to rotate. So that's just sort of the basics of each part that we would have for rotation. Um, if you feel like you need some more background knowledge, this wasn't quite enough. Uh, there is some more rotation notes here. And then if you feel like, okay, I got it, but I need to do some more practice, um, we have some practice problems. here. Okay. Um, hopefully this helps you and have a great day.